Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. The Shoshone Backcountry Horsemen will clean and maintain 104 miles of trails this summer, and they provide a big assist to the National Forest Service. Their work as volunteers is tough, important, and rewarding, but their ranks are thinning. We'll visit with one of the most active backcountry horseman groups in the country, the Shoshone Backcountry Horsemen, next on Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for Wyoming Chronicle is provided in part by the Dragicevich Foundation, supporting the work of the Wyoming Community Foundation. And we're pleased to be at the Sunlight Ranger Station in the Shoshone National Forest, just about 22 miles away from Yellowstone National Park with members of the Shoshone Backcountry Horsemen. Welcome to Wyoming Chronicle. Visiting with us today is Howard Sanders, Deb, Deb Black, excuse yeah. me, and Bob Bessler. Um, welcome to Wyoming Chronicle and thank you all for joining us. Thank you for coming. First, we have a lot to learn about the backcountry horsemen and the work that you do. Our viewers have seen a few of the pictures of the work that you've done in the backcountry in and around this part of Wyoming. But, but I think we'll start with the history, Bob, and let me begin with you to give us a little bit of background on what the backcountry horsemen do and specifically what the Shoshone backcountry horsemen do and how your groups evolved. Well, we basically started somewhere near 1991. Uh, Mr. Bill Brazelton was our, our founding person, and uh, where he learned about backcountry horsemen, I don't know. But him and another gentleman attempted to get it going at that time, and it failed. So he went to a meeting over in Buffalo, and I'm presuming that couple of gentlemen from Lander chapter that time, Mr. Al Sammons and, and another gentleman, uh, I think went over to present backcountry horsemen to some folks in Buffalo. And so then Bill got those two people to come to Powell and so then they tried it again and we've been a chapter ever since. We started in about 1993. 25 years ago, and uh, so we are mostly a service club. You know, we we tend to have a little on the side toward a riding club, but mostly we're a service club. And let's, let's get into more detail, Deb, about the work that that you do. If I were to ask you to tell me why do the backcountry horsemen exist in Wyoming, what would you tell me? Uh, these are dedicated people who understand the value of the land and taking care of it. Um, they understand taking care of your animals. At the end of the day, it's a hard day, but they take care of their animals first. But they're, they feel the responsibility to give back. So some of the principles of the Backcountry Horsemen of America match up with us really well, and that is to use common sense to take care of the country and manage it to work with those who do manage it, the government entities or the private entities, to um, teach no tra leave no trace principles where you don't damage, you, you use it and you move on, but you don't leave scars. Uh, to educate youth, we work with 4-H, we work with um, the, the Forest Service has a Kids in the Woods program for summer entertainment down in the valley. Well, they bring them up for different educational things every summer, we help with that. So teaching and mentoring is very important. Howard, how long have you been with the group and, and how many people are actively involved in, in what I've come to learn is really maybe one of the most active backcountry horseman groups in the country? I've, I've been with the club for about 11 years. Um, we have 90 members now. Um, actively, uh, sometimes I see as many as 16 or 17 when we're out doing trail work which is kind of nice when we're in wilderness and it's all by hand. Um, so it's picked up the last few years. Give me an idea of what's on your near-term agenda here. 
You were filming this just before the 4th of July, airing this in the fall. What is it that you are trying to um, get done this summer? Well, we have about 104 miles of trail that we've agreed with the Forest Service to clean this year. And so our objective, of course, is to get those trails done. And then if we have time, we pick others um, that we'll work on. Sometimes it's just maybe our favorite trail and no one else is cleaning it that, that summer, so we'll, we'll try to take care of that. In this area right here, we have the Alcorn Trail, which ties into the Elk Creek Trail that we've already cleaned into the Dead Indian Meadows. Uh, we have Little Sunlight, uh, which is mostly wilderness work. Um, we were gonna try to clean the Windy Trail over into uh, Reef Creek and around East Fork Painter, but the road's washed out. It's gonna be a lot longer ride, so we're gonna have to pick a different day to do that than maybe not this weekend, um, but we'll get them done. So people are, they're hiking, they're utilizing um, the trails, they're riding, they're, they're seeing the great backcountry. What does it mean to clean a trail? What are, what are your tasks, Bob, when you're out doing that work? Well, we don't get probably as involved, you know, we clean them and make them passable. Uh, our function is not to reconstruct unless it's entirely necessary. When we get to a trail that we are cleaning, uh, you know, if there's a washout, then then we're allowed to go ahead and reconstruct what's necessary to get around that washout. But normally, we're we're just clean the trail uh, to Forest Service standards. Uh, Trees that have fa um, fell, those type that type of work. That type of work, and and right now there's a lot of that simply because of of the fires in '88 and also the the beetle problem that everybody is aware of mm -hmm. in Wyoming. Uh, there's lots of, lots of dead trees and so. Uh, if your groups didn't do this work, who would do it? Well, that's one of our coalitions with the Forest Service that's so beneficial. They are in charge of keeping trails open for the public. That's one of their functions. And they don't have the budget or the manpower to do it. So we, a number of years ago, started taking part in their cost share agreement where they assign us trails that they want open for the public, and those are some that Howard is alluding to when we say we've got to hunt a certain number. And we clean those, and it helps them because the trails get cleaned. It helps us because we make a little bit of money off the deal. And that money goes right back into trailhead projects. Those are the ones that sometimes we're known for because our name is on them, and that's where that money comes from. This is totally a volunteer outfit. Yes, strictly volunteer. And when we clean the trails, we clean essentially a six foot wide by 10 foot high corridor. So we, if there's a tree across the trail, we buck it out. If there are limbs that have grown into the trail, we trim those out because you have to leave a trail open <coughs> so that if someone's got a pack animal with panniers on four foot wide, you need to be able to clear that so they can get by there. Also, if you meet a, another horse on the trail, you need to be able to get by each other in some places you can't just step aside, and so that's what we clean. Give me an idea of some of the challenges that your group faces, whether it's it's in membership, whether it's political challenges, and and you'll all have an opportunity to to hop in. But Bob, if I were to ask you some of the, your near-term challenges, how would you respond? What what makes it kind of hard for you to do what you'd like to get done? Well, there's a number of things. The public land issue is is, is a major thing right now. Uh, you know, the public lands need to stay in the public hands uh, in for the public, and and turning them over to the state would be, uh, in our opinion, a certain disaster uh, because these lands uh, are managed by the government agency. BLM Forest Service, and in my opinion, at least they have done an excellent job over the years, and they will continue to do a great job. Uh, and they're the people, the state of Wyoming does not have the resources it would take to manage the lands. And sure, there's things that, that the agencies do that we don't agree with here, there, and yonder. There's always something, but uh, for the most part, I think they just really do a great job of managing our public lands. And that's, what I think I hear you saying is you have a great partnership 
with the federal partners that you've worked with? Oh, absolutely. What are some other challenges for your group? I mean, like me, everyone's aging a little bit. Is it, is it hard to recruit um, um, younger folks who are busy with families and um, it, busy with jobs? And It is, getting the word out that and, um, it's a certain type of person who's got the livestock to begin with. And so approaching them through 4-H or different connections where we, we know of families that at least have the livestock, that's a start. But we are aging out. Uh, I don't know what our average age Howard would be, but it'd be up there a bit. In the 30s, tell me, right? Yeah, yeah. well, plus. <laughs> <laughs> we wish. But certainly the as we look at younger generations who are more urbanized, just because population keeps growing, they're into their machines and not the outdoors. But when they do have an outdoor experience, they remember it. Are you concerned that young people today, and even young people in Wyoming, don't, for lack of a better term, value the outdoors like um, younger generations did maybe years and years ago? I think education is the key. and. And, with, and that's in the past and that's now, and it's in the future. You have to educate people about these lands and help people understand these public lands don't just belong to those of us from Wyoming. They belong to the person who lives in New York also. See, they're actual public lands and, and they belong to us all. And, and if, if you can educate people on how to take care of the lands, help them understand that when we do improved trailhead projects, um, we do that for several reasons. One is to help disperse the use in the forest. If you just have one trailhead that's good, everybody comes there. If you improve multiple trailheads, then people spread out, and then you do less damage, less impact on the on the uh, environment. Um, so, to me, education is the key. There's some new uses that have kind of evolved, and I'm thinking of um, um, bicycles. Um, off-country, um, our off-road use of people that, that ride mountain bikes on trails um, up to wilderness boundaries. Um, has that been problematic for people that like to enjoy Forest Service trails or, or any trails really in, in um, the outdoors of Wyoming? Or is it, again, is it an education issue? How's that evolving with um, people that like to utilize mountain bikes on trails? Well, it is education as, as well as just common courtesy. Um, whether it's a backpacker or a bicyclist, if they're coming up on a horse, an animal reacts to everything that they know. And if it's something they haven't met before, that's a frightening <coughs> thing. My husband and I came over a ridge top and there had been a, a group of Cub Scouts who had been hiking in the rain with their slickers. Well, they heard our horses, so they got off the trail and they ducked down in the bushes and were quiet. When they all stood up, my horse about went over backwards. We got them to talk and then everything settled down. They just need to identify what a, what a, a hiker or a bicyclist is. So when you approach a, on, a, on a horse, someone who's coming at you on a mountain bike, what, what do you, tell me what you hope happens. How, well, how should that be managed? First thing I hope for is that they're courteous enough to slow down. Um, yet they have, they have to understand that that horse is a prey animal and everything is out to get it. That's the way they see things. And and guess what? They have a predator sitting on its back to start with. They're having to contend with that. If the bicyclist understands enough to slow down and talk to us, so the horse can recognize them as a person and not just who knows what. Um, I live next to a highway. Bicycles go by there all the time. My horse will get used to it. But if they meet one up here, it's like, what is that bicycle doing here? But unfortunately, the, folks that I've met, it's been on an uphill grade for them, so they were off pushing the bicycle and they were courteous and, and spoke to us and so the horses were fine with it. Um, and so education, once again, um, and I have a, I, I have an acquaintance in, in Idaho that rides bicycle and he has a little trailer he pulls behind it and he cleans his own trails so he can mountain bike on those trails. So he assists with, with what, how he wants to enjoy his recreation. Yeah, that's exactly right. So. Is it an issue for mountain bikers wanting maybe perhaps more and more to change wilderness laws to have access? Is that something that you're politically uh, have taken a position on or is that something that you really don't deal with, um, at least not yet? Well, I think our position on it is a bicycle is a mechanical device. And mechanical devices are not allowed in the wilderness, that's by the law. And that was, I seriously, when the law was written, sure there weren't bicycles there at that time, but it was written no mechanical devices, um, and that is. 
I think it's interesting that um, that applies to you and the work that you do in the pictures that we're showing to our viewers right here. You're not clearing a lot of your trails with chainsaws. No, when we hit the wilderness, the chain, chainsaws <clears throat> are packed away, stashed. We get out the cross cuts and we get some complaints sometimes, from, even from our members, you know, but that's just <laughs> the way it is. Sure. Um, it's by hand and, and when we come back, we gather up the chainsaws and going back to the house. Deb, our viewers right now are seeing a beautiful crosscut saw that's been mm -hmm. um, a local artist has now touched. Right. Uh, give us it's, the backstory with that saw. Certainly, that's one of our crosscut cross cut saws that has been used and its life has um, depleted its ability to be sharpened again. So one of our members painted a beautiful scene on it and we have used that for a money-making project and that money will go to the Dano Youth Camp where they take uh, young people in batches of girls camp and a boys camp, they teach them mountain skills, and then they take them up for backpacking in the mountains. It's a beautiful little saw. It yeah. really is. Thank it you. It really is. That's a great idea. Bob, I assume your group communicates with each other through meetings? How does that work? Uh, excuse me? Through I'm... meetings, your group gets together periodically for, yeah, to meet and plan? Yeah, we meet once, once a month with the exception of the summer months, and in our meeting this month is going to be tomorrow night right here in the in the meadows so uh, yeah we do meet every every month uh, and uh, we try to bring in a speaker of some kind and talk about different issues and and things sometimes the forest service and sometimes a game warden and just that's that for me entertainment but uh, not only do you clear trails you build corrals and our viewers now are looking at a a beautiful set of corrals that were constructed two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, um, tell me what we're seeing, um, snow and all. Well, it's back when we first started, we built most of that stuff out of, uh, out of um, pipe. But we, we could get donations at that time through oil companies uh, in scrap, scrap tubing. Well, that's kind of dried up on us now, so uh, it, you know, we, we, we certainly could use some more, but uh, we started using panels for our corral construction now. And then uh, one thing that the market, I mean, it's kind of dried up on us. And the other thing is it's got too uh, cost... Uh, Prohibitive? The what? Prohibitive? Too yeah. expensive. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the labor got too high to hire welders and whatever, and so we started building them out of, out of panels. And um, the ones you're probably seeing there are the, the South Fork of the Wood. And that's, a, that's an interesting thing in itself because we tried to, several ways to get by these panels to get what we wanted that was heavy enough that we could weld on. And our attempts didn't go well. And so someone suggested a local college, um, Northwest College here in Powell, and, and they have a welding program. And I said, well, do they do that sort of thing? And, well, he gave me a name, and I went up and talked to him. And he said, sure, we'll build your panels. Uh, and so the, the neat thing about it is, is they can't charge you for their labor. The panels are actually less money. They charge you for all the materials. And then when they're done, the club will give them a donation. Go into what they call a rod burners club. They turn around and use what you've donated to them to put on their spring welding contest, which they in turn recruit new members sure, sure. to the college. So it's just a big circle, and the money goes around and around, and and so that has worked really well for us. And I must say that the the panels they built are by far the best best panels that we've ever put up. I mean, the corral looks great, but the snow looked arduous to me. <laughs> <laughs> what happened there? <laughs> it was 65 degrees the day that we moved in and got set up, and and we laid out our pattern, we laid out the panels, and we woke up the next morning to snow and still snowing. So we had to clear everything off to even find the panels. And, um, and, and this was a joint venture too, by the way. The Forest Service had actually cleared the location and graveled it. Um, 
our county recreation department had, had contributed money to help buy the panels and then we were doing all the labor and providing all the tubing for the posts and and um, and we had one of the local uh, equipment rental outfits had had uh, given us the use of a skid steer bless their heart because we used that for removing snow and, sure. and uh, augering the holes and haul, we had to haul the cement with that <clears throat> skid steer from the cement truck to the post because it was so muddy uh, we couldn't get the truck anywhere near near it and I think we had what 16 inches of snow through that period um, nobody quit everybody just kept working and we got the project finished Howard, we've talked about um, cleaning trails and building corrals, but there are other projects that you guys are actively involved in. Yes, we, we do. Um, we do parking delineators to help people understand how they should park and make the best use of the parking area. We do feed bunks and stanchions, um, and we refurbish those. Um, we are currently involved with a trail intersection sign project um, our club bought 63 signs that meet four service specs, and we're going to be putting those up. They're trail intersection signs all the way from the Beartooth down through this area here. Um, phase one was 63 signs, and we hope for a phase two that it will work on. We tried for several years to, to try to get a sign program going, and things didn't work out, but we just kept watching. And, and then when things came together with the local forest service, we got person, they got personnel in that we that uh, saw that as a great need. A part of it is um, safety. When you get out there, you don't know what if it's a, you know, cow trail or what, or it just goes over to a camp. Um, you get in an emergency situation. It's nice to know where that trail's going. GPS and all, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Oh yes. That, it's not just the Forest Service that you've developed partnerships with over the years. That's true. Um, BLM, the Wyoming Game and Fish. Uh, anybody who needs some help, and I say that because many times it's a project that an agency needs help with and they, they know our reputation and they'll bring a project to us and ask if we're interested in helping or if we have the, the manpower and time that particular summer. So that's worked out so well and uh, the cost share is really great with the Forest Service because we get some money out of it, but that's not the only thing. It's the work and, and our members feel responsible. And I was reminded recently that responsibility is made up of two words, response and ability. And we have the ability to get back in the back country and haul items like this, the signs and different things for projects. And we have the uh, ability, so we're responding. So it would be nice to see younger generations step up to this act of responding to needs that they see. Uh, you don't have to have a horse to be a member. You know what strikes me is that so often you hear how difficult it is to to shrink it down to work with government. Mm -hmm. But that's what you do, and, and you've been able to do that successfully. What's what's the magic? What what can people learn from this? It's, it's you know we've heard over the years that you know you cannot work with a government agency here or there, and in this area we have had absolutely no problems. They. They work with us very, very well, and it doesn't make any difference, as Deb said, the BLM or the Forest Service. or uh, We just have had a great working relationship since day one. And uh, so it's worked out for, well, for the general public. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Who, now, is, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but are you concerned for the future? Are, are you gonna be able, is this group gonna be able to survive for 10 years? With, 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 with folks, have, how's, how's that gonna hammer out here? Well, in 10 years, there are gonna be some faces that will change, mine being one of them, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and we just hope that, um, we do have some, some younger members that have joined us, and we hope the word gets out that, um, that it's not all work, it's fun. If we can't have fun, we just go home. And, it, and it's gotta be the case too, that there are some members who can be involved with everything you do, and then other members who can maybe help out here and there. They're just as important to you. Would you agree with that? Oh yes, we have, well like Deb said, you don't have to own a horse or a mule to, to be a member, and that's because we have projects like the Kids in the Woods where we have members that don't necessarily ride anymore, or don't have any intention to ride, but they can still help with that project. And so we just, you know, you do what you can and, and we'll take you. And 
I'm granted we clean between 130 and 240 miles of trail a year, so we need help doing that. But with these other projects, we'll take people that don't necessarily ride. Are, is your group managed with dues? Do you have, you know, some some dues that people would contribute either annually, either to your group or to a national group? We do. We have dues, and then a portion goes on to state, and another portion on to national because we do network as a nation with all the different chapters, um, and that some stays at home. So. We do have dues, but our main main money comes from the cost share. Next year, or the year following, what do you what do you have planned? What what is it that you really want to see accomplished? Maybe two, three years down the road. What what's highest on your priority list? We'll give you all a crack at that. <laughs> Bob, go ahead. Boy, that that's tough. Because, because it seems to me like your work's never done. And it it is that's true, and and I would think right now biggest priority is probably recruitment just because like we, had we about. are we are an elderly I call us a geriatric society because we have very few members out here running a handsaw that's less than 60 years old uh, and so in in I I realized that the young people are raising families but if we can get them for maybe one day a year come out and and help out on something you know that's all we need you know get just chip in a little bit but um, our club like most of the clubs are we're getting old and you true though it, it is true that you're one of the most active clubs not just in Wyoming and there are seven chapters in Wyoming that's I correct. should point that out and we'll show our viewers a list of those those clubs but you're one of the most active groups in in the country we we evidently are and uh, so one of the projects we've worked on in several years is to take down old fence that was put up years and years ago when <clears> there was more grazing. And we work with Wilderness Society and some other groups to go to a site. So these are examples of someone who doesn't own a horse, but they like to hike. There are many ways that we can put all those active young people to work. We have grandkids and they all want to do things and they appreciate the, the wild lands. We just need to let them know there are ways that they could join us and be a part of this. Well, Howard Sanders, Deb Black, and Bob Bessler, thank you so much for sharing the good work of the Shoshone Backcountry Horsemen and for joining us today on Wyoming Chronicle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.